It is. All right. It seems that we, Molly, we're, we're and Victor, we are once again, we're live broadcasting from Nearsoft's Mexico City office. And it seems that we, Molly, we're, we're, welcome, welcome to another edition. Let me just, let me turn off my monitor because it's confusing. There you go. All right. That's it. Sorry about that, folks. I was. Give me a minute, please, guys. This always happens at the, the beginning. We are experiencing technical difficulty. No, no, it's really not a technical difficulty. This is always something that happens uh, because. I, okay, there you go. I got rid of it. It's just that I have another window as a monitor, so but I just got rid of it because I was listening to myself with echo. <laughs> so it's not good. All right. Okay. Um, thank you for for being here. I want to welcome you, all of you, uh, Victor and Molly. Thank you for accepting having this chat with us. And also thanks, uh, thank you to my coworker Victor, who Victor uh, Castrejon, who happens to be in our Hermosillo office. Uh, Victor is going to be is was kind enough to accept my invitation to be a co-host. He's like the technical uh, expert here. I'm not, <laughs> so just so that you know. And uh, today's uh, topic, well, uh, and uh, I'm gonna be, we're gonna be talking about uh, the, the, the today's topic is named Webolution 2015, JavaScript accessibility and identity in our ever evolving world. Now, Molly, talk about you chose this to this name, Molly. So talk about um, a rather catchy name, if I say, if I may say so. <laughs> Tell us. Uh, I'll, um, I'll let uh, I'll let pass on the mic to you, Molly, and let you do the talking. Okay. Okay. And I just want to tell the audience two things. That uh, I want to remind everyone that if you're watching us from our channel, you are you can send us your questions by clicking on the interact with us prompt right there at the bottom left hand side of the screen. Just click there, send us your questions. We'll read them here and uh, we'll we'll discuss them with Molly. Okay, so guys, I leave you with Molly Holtz Schlag. She is right now in Tucson, Arizona, and she is um, has over 25 years of online experience, and her relationship to the web and technologies is very unique. And her award-winning contributions advocate user-first, accessible building of websites and applications with adherence to the highest, highest of industry standards, ethics, and principles. So, Molly, welcome so much. Thank you. And Let's go back to the topic, Molly. Why Webolution? Why, what's, what's this? Where did this come from, Molly? Well, thank you so much, Carlos, for letting me join you at Dojo Live, uh, Mexico City, and Hermosillo, which is just where Victor is. It's just a little bit south of me, not too exactly. far away. Yeah. So uh, we're kind of distributed um, group here. At any rate, one of the things that I was considering when you uh, approached me for uh, a, a talk on Dojo Live is, is what I was facing coming back after a couple of years having been away from the active web development. So I had been paying attention to what was going on, but I was unable to work due to illness, as many folks know, and so I really was thinking what stands out to me at this point uh, in the evolution of the web or uh, the, the growing of the web, what has moved on in a positive way, what do I, what do I sense unease about. So I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about what that was like. I know that there are many people out there that are coming to web development and design um, new or again after having been away or suffering burnout big time. Uh, we see a lot of that I think in the folks that have been you know working 20 years plus in this industry and developing standards and so on really have been you know uh, I think challenged at every turn. 
And so we've really had to, um, I think, just sit down and look at, at, at where we're at. What what is uh what are the issues of the day and that things that we need to talk about in our hopeful move forward? Uh, I always see the web as being an evolutionary technology. It is not meant to be done. I <laughs> I had a student once yelled out in class, "When are we going to be done?" <laughs> You know, doesn't that sound silly to you? I don't know about other people, but to me that just sounds like, what do you mean? When is the web going to be done? That doesn't make any sense, right? It's It should be a never-ending kind of, you know, when we get to the matrix or the singularity, maybe we'll be done. <laughs> but I, don't, I think that it's evolution. And so it goes back to that. Where are our strengths? Where are our uh, weaknesses and where do we need to adjust ourselves to continue on an evolving path? Nice. Okay. There you go. So that's cool. where that's where it all came from, right? Yeah. So that's where the, the idea of the webvolution thing came out because I was also thinking of... Uh, you know, how could this be something perhaps that maybe I'd revisit each year, like I'd want to do, or more than a year, like if I wanted to do it twice a year, it might be nice to just kind of check in, you know, what is what are people feeling, what are they thinking, what are other, other designers, developers, people of the web, you know, what are they frustrated with, challenged by, uh, and so forth. Carlos, is it beer o'clock over there? Because you guys sound like you're having a really good time. Is that is that where the party is? It sounds like there's a lot of laughter and noise oh. I'm getting. Is that over with you? It, it might be. I mean, it could be either here or uh, in the Mosillo. So what we can do is while you talk, we'll just mute ourselves. Okay. that sounds. I was just hearing the, a lot of the background noise. At any rate, so that that's also one of the reasons I thought it'd be good to be a you know a, a kind of a continuing or iterative thing to do. Get into the habit of looking at our work, where we're at, thinking about ourselves, where, and that's the identity part: is where do we as web developers fit in, and how do we take care of our skill sets and our uh, our growth and our learning? as we try to evolve and become better and more adept at what we do. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I was, just, I was on mute. I had to mute myself. So excellent, you, you know, Molly, um, I appreciate your, your elaborating on this a little bit. And uh, especially for, for, for us who are um, the non-illustrated, non not enlightened on all, on all these uh, uh, te technology matters, so to speak. <laughs> okay, and okay, we're gonna. St I'd like to um, go just to jump into the the next part of after your kind introduction about where this the top, where the name uh, Webolution came from. Um, I'd like to first of all make a little pause and again remind everyone that you can ask your questions right here in our YouTube channel. There's a little prompt right there. Look for it down below, left hand side in yellow, it says interact with us. So click in there or it, uh, it could be in Spanish, if you're in Mexico, you can see it uh, in Spanish. Okay, having said this, um, before I pass on the, mi the mic to Victor, who is a technology es expert, and uh, from the standpoint of a non- Technologically, from a technologically challenged person, just like myself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, 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 this is just a figure of speech because I, you know, I have working knowledge, but I'm not far, far less, uh, <laughs> you're far more uh, technological than you might think. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm, you know, of course, I have, to, I know what I, what I need to know, but I'm always learning. Okay, so you know, always. I'm on the, on the marketing side. Okay, Molly. When you thought about okay of this particular topic, when you said okay, revolution, and then the description, the tagline, and when after our conversation or our initial conversations, you who were you think of aiming this particular topic or talk to? 
Well, there were actually, as we were discussing with Victor and, and yourself, Carlos, as we were talking about the types of people that we'd be potentially uh, reaching out to would be uh, web developers, uh, folks interested in the user experience uh, and accessibility as well, uh, and also um, a little bit about uh, going to the managers and, uh, and folks that are working to help with uh, process and uh, project management workflow. Uh, so identity, that part of identity really has to do with what are we called? What are we calling ourselves? How do we begin to identify who we are and, and what the languages are as web development and the web, uh, building the web in general becomes ever more complex and ever more and more silos of expertise, deep expertise that are required. So how do we kind of, um, you know, have good leadership in management as well, where we communicate uh, equally and uh, with, uh, you know, with a, a sense of language, you know, what are we calling, a, are we a web, what is a web designer, what does that really mean, what is a web developer, what does that really mean, you know, let's really lock down our identities, I'm thinking that that's an important and big missing piece from the entire picture, right, so I think that there's a bit of the talk that also extends to folks that are just thinking about how do I hire, how do I manage a project, how do I, uh, if I have a background as a graphic designer, a web designer, uh, a front end only, maybe I'm good at HTML and CSS, a little SVG, but I'm not a really brilliant JavaScripter, that would be me. Um, <laughs> you know, if I, if, you know, we each have our own combination of skill sets. So, that I think is we have to learn how to better identify ourselves and it seems like there is a dovetail in that with the JavaScript and accessibility because you're starting to get into like with JavaScript we're seeing so much uh, evolution of, of programming and application development versus the document of you know the web of, of documents so it's a web of applications now far more, or we're looking at it far more through that perspective. So JavaScript becomes of issue. And then, of course, accessibility becomes of issue, technically speaking, but also from a workflow standpoint. Um, so I'm looking at it really, I think, more from the meta. Where are these things in the current, uh, in the current world, and how are we looking at specialties as we become more and more application centric, uh, and if that's even a good idea, right? So hopefully that kind of addresses it, as well as even getting into some of the concerns that I have. Okay. 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 Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Time. Uh, okay. Before, uh, sorry, Victor. I have one more question for Molly, sure. if I may, and then. It's the mic is going to be all yours. And this is because, Molly, as I was, uh, again, reading from your information here, you refer to yourself as a, this is what pulled my attention, as a technology strategist. That This is the first time that I hear or that I read this term. Or uh, So why would you call yourself a technology? What is this technology strategist, by the way? Okay. Uh, so, no, very good question. Thank you. So, what you're asking then to define what I mean by technology yes. strategy? What yes. is that role? Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, it's it, it is a role that is uh, identified, and this goes back to also the issue of identity on the web. Uh, my, I really began to analyze what is it that I do. What you know? Am I a developer? Am I a designer? Am I a user experience person? No, I'm a strategist. What I do is I sit down and I look at all of these things and I say, okay, here's a need, uh, a client has a need or a group has a need, whether it's to learn or to create an app or a website or a conference or a book, whatever. Okay, it doesn't matter what the end product is of the project. 
but that's whatever the project is I'm the person who sits down does like looks at okay what do we have so I do an analysis of what we have and then I look at all of that and I make determinations based on budgets environment uh, long-term goals not just short-term gains very very important very important uh, concept and iterative thinking as well so bringing that all around to coming up with a strategic way to approach any project okay so I'm that person who can usually kind of lead it or manage it but I wouldn't say a project manager in the traditional sense it's a strategy it's saying okay after analyzing your circumstances in the Mexico City office this is what I would say might be the a, a workflow that works best in this environment and let's say you're trying to hook up two different uh, uh, locations right and have a distributed but they're in different hour uh, time zones right as we often have to work with on the web so what kind of workflow goes there so I begin to examine, analyze, and then provide a strategy to you. Okay, so using technology as the common language. All right, so here's here's what I think you should be doing. Yes, this might be a place where you want a framework. No, you don't want to touch a framework. If framework, which framework? Okay, yes, you all sites and all apps must be accessible. There is there is no other option okay accessibility doesn't have an alternative it, it is okay we, we have to build that into our ethics so when we look at that we can also say okay how do we strategically use this technology or how do we put this into our technology strategy for the long term so that we don't have to think about tacking it on after the project okay which is often what happens so that's really where that comes from, and that's what I saw my skill set was most akin to uh, analysis and strategy in relation to open technologies as they relate to the web. Excellent. Excellent. That, that, that makes a lot of sense, 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 by the way. By the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me. To me. <laughs> Let alone to Victor. Victor, I'm going to pass on the mic to you. Uh, I think uh, you had assembled, Victor. Uh, a series of, of questions or topics to discuss with Molly. So uh, the mic has, the mic's all yours. So this, um, I'm going to uh, leave you, uh, Molly, with Victor. And, and Victor, go right ahead. Thank you, Carlos. And yes. Thanks, Carlos. I mean, I'm going to be here, but uh, he's going to do the talking now. There he is. <laughs> Hi, Molly. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for taking your time to talk with us. Uh, my first question is, um, I remember a project that you were involved uh, that was uh, 10 years ago, something like that, is uh, CSS Sin Garden. I remember that website that was my source of inspiration when I started to de develop a website using uh, standards because uh, before that, uh, everybody was doing um, a, a, a websites like I don't know. Uh, it, it, no, 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 nobody was uh, taking account the, the the standards and and stuff like that. And I remember that was a very very big good good project, and that most of the people that want to start uh, and and also. In advance, uh, they want to know about what can you complete with uh, CSS and, and HTML. I remember that there, there was a, a lot of, of, of galleries or, or, or I don't know uh, styles that were already there. What happened with that? Okay, so actually, let me back up a moment, Victor, and tell you that first of all, it's lovely to speak to you again. Uh, just so <laughs> the audience doesn't may not know this, but uh, we actually met in Mexico uh, some years ago. It would be almost—is it really almost ten years ago? Yeah, I think. ten years ago. Oh, God. <laughs> That's crazy. Anyway, so 
what you're referring to is, uh, first of all, the site, the, the CSS Zen Garden, okay? So that site was created by Dave Shea, all right? So Mezzo Blue, he's, he was known as Mezzo Blue online. He's also, uh, his, his full name, Dave Shea, very well-known designer, and it was totally his idea. I had nothing to do with the initial uh, site itself. What he had basically done is he had taken some markup, and in, at that point we were using XHTML, not HTML5, but we were using XHTML 1.0, and I believe he was using a transitional doc type <laughs> where, when those things still mattered. Um, and he wrote a document using as semantic markup as he could for that period of time, and the idea was then every designer that came along, whoever needs to mute, is that you, Carlos? There's somebody's having way too much fun in the background over there. <laughs> I don't know who it is, but I keep hearing the party. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's uh, probably Victor. Victor, can you mute yourself while? Uh, yeah, true, while true. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> okay. So at any rate, I'm sorry, Victor. Uh, at, at any rate, so Dave Shea had built built an XHTML document and. Uh, and created some content in it, and he put out the challenge to designers, visual designers especially, this was the goal, was to show how a CSS and standards-based website, um, his goal was to, you know, prove the idea that, uh, proof of concept, I guess, would be the way to describe that, uh, to show how designers could do an amazing job without ever touching the markup. So that was the goal. They could only use CSS, right, to bring in whatever imagery, whatever design, whatever uh, uh, layouts, whatever they wanted at that point. And remember, we were just working with CSS 2.1 at that point, and we didn't really have all kinds of, you know, we had to do a lot of things that we don't do anymore uh, for uh, layout and compatibility, we were, we were pretty much limited to floats uh, and some positioning, uh, but in terms of layout, it was a brave new world at that time. This is a decade ago, right? So, or more. So really, he really pushed, what Dave Shea really did, I think, um, that deserves, you know, incredible uh, uh, recognition is he, he really did that proof of concept and what happened is, is that designer after designer took the challenge and within a, a, a few months time I believe he would have the exact details the site itself was becoming an ever-growing garden literally of magnificent uh, beautiful uh, designs all based on that one document proving that it was really how the individual uh, could use CSS to bring about all of uh, a visual and some dynamic as well uh, behaviors. So it was really um, a proof of concept and it was so wonderful and impressive that I think that it just you know, it really began to shift people's thinking. Um, and then what happened was at South by Southwest, of course, every year there's the big South by Southwest uh, festival in Austin, Texas. And back then, 10 years ago, it was still quite um, personable. It's become huge, just um, impossibly enormous. But I was there speaking, and I believe Dave was there speaking on panels and uh, uh, things of that nature. And the two of us got together. And we had also been doing work on the Web Standards Project. So I, I believe either he was a member at that time or became a member right around that time. And I, of course, at that point was group lead. And so it was during one of, the, uh, one of our meetings or at some point where, where Dave and I sat down and began to talk and began to come up with the idea of co-authoring a book. Because he had never written a book and he had been considering writing a book. And uh, the next thing we knew, I, I flew away from South by Southwest and I was on my way to a uh, publishing conference where I met with then New Writers um, Vice President Nancy Renzel and she said, hey, you got any ideas? And I said, well, there's this thing online called the CSS Zen Garden. Yeah, I've got ideas. And we presented 
the idea and they loved it and out of that came the book. So we co-wrote the book. So that's where my involvement came really came in was in in bringing that about. And one of the things I want to address Victor that was really really fascinating to me and that I think many people who have either read that book or know the site and are familiar with it was that what we did is when we wrote the book, we split up um, this, we split up a, a number of different uh, uh, of the designs, and we deconstructed and reconstructed them, showing aspects of different techniques that people were using. So we were showing different types of image replacement for the time. Very, it was very progressive for the time. In retrospect, it seems so silly now with responsive design. I shouldn't say silly. It's not silly. It's amazing. But it, in retrospect, uh, we've come a long way, baby, as as they as they say. So that's really where uh, where I came into the picture with the Zen, CSS Zen Garden. I never had anything to do with the site so much as expressing it through the book. And one of the things that was so great for me as a CSS, uh, you know, at that time working with CSS a great deal and working on the CSS working group as well with the W3C, um, it was incredible to have to rebuild what designers had built so that in CSS so that was a, a, a voyage of great learning for me uh, simply by writing that book I had my mind completely blown when it came to what really could be realized with CSS and I think other people felt that at that time as well which is why it continues to this day to be such an important um, site in terms of our history uh, and our legacy and the fact that those designs are still beautiful designs you know they they retain their beauty and their simplicity perhaps even better than HTML5 does so <laughs> just saying amazing hey Molly, uh, let's talk about access accessibility um, uh, what is this coming from what is uh, this what is this is this for everybody? Is this the, the so only a website that has to be with uh, has to deal with with persons that have uh, some problems has to have or, or every website has to have uh, accessibility in some level? Right. So I think th the way we have to think about this, we have to change our thinking. A accessibility isn't an add-on. Uh, it isn't a piece that we give to other people because they have a special need. It's there. Let's look at the word, access, right? The web, to get on the web is to access the web. I access the web, you access the web. The web needs to be accessible, okay? So if we think about it in its broader meaning, it means everybody should have access. That includes all human beings despite whatever perceived abilities or disabilities they may or may not have. Now, when we talk about the techniques and technologies, the advantages that come with a well-constructed website that follows and adheres to standards and practices that include accessibility, WCAG and all of these, and ARIA, way ARIA, uh, for applications. Um, we have the technologies to make our our applications more rich in accessibility. We have uh, uh, the ability to make our websites uh, uh, very diversified. Now the way to think about it is, I don't know about, you know, I see Carlos is a little maybe more my age, but this is what starts to happen to people, right? Uh, right around 40, uh, if they haven't been wearing glasses their whole lives, they're going to start looking at the bottle or the book like this, right? right, yeah, now, like that, right? <laughs> Carlos, yeah? You know yeah. what I'm talking about, yeah? Absolutely. So this happens to everybody. So we have to remember that that it isn't about our abilities and disabilities. It isn't about being disabled. It's about being a human being in the world. And at some point, we are all going to have a preference or a need. One great example where this totally ties it together for a lot of people is keyboard. Okay, How many people out there, I know for a fact that 
I love to navigate the whole world by the keyboard. I much prefer using keyboard than I do a mouse or other input strokes, right? So I like to use keystroke combinations to get through, as mu and I'm much faster that way. Uh, and I think that a lot of people feel that. If we do not take the time to make, uh, to think about keyboarding in an application, right? If we don't take the opportunity to do that, we're not giving users with that preference who may have no accessibility needs as we think we understand accessibility, right? We're taking away that, that facility, that actual ability to access the web in a preferential way. So it's not just, I have to have this, it's I want this. Uh, another a good example is with speech, input, output, right, uh, or text. How many times, you know, are you looking at video after video, maybe you're doing research on something. Sometimes I just want to pick it up, print it out, and walk outside and not look on the screen and sit under a tree, right? So I have to have access to that modality. We have to remember that the web was built to be delivered to as many modalities, devices, as possible. That means people as well, OK? So I think we really have to start remembering that access is built in. You, you, if you can't access the building, how can you get into the room where you're supposed to do your work, right? So that it, it's all about getting in the door. Uh, that said, that's where I then uh, advocate putting the process. When you begin a project, that's when you begin talking about these features, keyboard, uh, uh, alternative media, uh, managing uh, application and navigation, uh, managing changes and things that might states, you know, states that uh, state changes with a, a rich internet application nowadays. You know, you may uh, click on a button and an update occurs seamlessly. How do we get that information across? Well, we have a technology for that, and that's ARIA, okay? So accessibility for rich internet applications. So use those things, not just because they extend to people who might otherwise have a limitation, but because it opens up the possibilities for everybody, okay? And that's really where I think I like to advocate the perspective to come from, OK? And you start your project with that in mind. You don't tack it on later, because that's not only an economic disaster, it's also a usability problem, right? If you don't put these things into a user application, just if you were working, let's say you were building a, a Microsoft Word, right? If you were building a, an application, a desktop application, you want that to be accessible, right? So you would want that to have keyboarding and all of those types of shortcuts that we're accustomed to using. Well, I want the same thing out of my web app. Why not, right? So I hope that kind of addresses at least the perspective that I have about accessibility, that it isn't a different thing. It isn't something that we should look at as separate from quality. It is equivalent to quality. It is equivalent. We need it as much as we need HTML as much as we need CSS as much as we need any other technology to do the job. OK. okay. Uh, Molly, we have one question from the audience. I'd like to, um, okay, so I'd like to read it out to you, and then you can uh, simply provide your response. We had, this question came through Twitter and by Edgar Parada. From Mexico, oh, yeah. from Mexico uh -huh. City, and his question is, <clears throat> um, what do you think about Microsoft dropping support for Internet Explorer on Gen January the 16th? Uh, what do you think will become the public enemy, like Chrome? <laughs> and, and, and then he sends me a second, uh, like an addendum. He says, by Chrome, I meant from a web standards point of view, not blaming its contributions to the actual world. You know, he, okay. I got him. I know Edgar. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank right. you. Thank you, Edgar. <laughs> okay. Excellent question. And 
I'm uh, boy because it's a, a, a po it's a politician's world right now. So I guess I got to play politics. Um, you know, Edgar rem remembers me, and so does Victor, for that matter. Uh, for you know, for really that the the days of the web standards fighting and the advocacy and all of that. And I think that we've come a long way with browsers. And I don't really, I really don't want to go down the the path again of making enemies and having to fight things out uh, in a war room, you know, it just isn't fun. There's enough negativity in the world without having to add to it, right? So I think that we do see, we do see um, a problem. It's very funny. I think that the question goes to something I wanted to discuss anyway, which is with browsers, if we were to roll back 10 years in the past. Ten years ago, many people were saying, why doesn't everybody just use WebKit? Why doesn't everybody just use this? You know, whatever was open source, okay? So the, the original stuff that went into WebKit, the KHTML and all of that, okay? So that was being advocated because everybody wanted to have some semblance of interoperability between browsers and support for the CSS without all the hacking that we had to do back in the time, much as I was describing uh, with the Zen Garden. So I think then what, what has happened is that's what really ended up happening is we went toward a time where the open source nature of browsers, so Chrome went on its own, it took parts of what it did and Blink the Blink engine. Uh, we see with Opera giving up Presto and taking on also, you know, uh, aspects of other open source code like in Blink and WebKit. Um, and we see that happening across the board. So what that has gained us is better consistency across the engines, layout, things of that nature, performance, where we're losing, and what Edgar is so right to point out, is when we become too unclear as to where, uh, as it, you know, when there's only one real code base anymore, even if it's open sourced, we end up in a one browser world again. So by trying to create the interoperability across various browsers, what we've ended up with is really creating a core browser engine that is somewhat shared across all browsers with a different face looking at it. So I think that, yeah, there's a concern. Uh, we, we always need somebody poking at that status quo um, because otherwise, yeah, somebody's going to try to gain ownership or, or uh, intellectual property at some point. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but I just want to point out that 10 years ago, what we were asking for is essentially what we got. So for all of you who are asking for it, we ended up with a, 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 a de facto one browser engine world, de facto, not real, but sort of, because we so desperately want and need to have that interoperability. So it's, it's, you know, which do you do? It's six of one, half of those and the other. So I don't really know. But I do think that we have to be very, very careful for anybody who tries to own a chunk of the web. Um, I, an article was just published uh, on the, uh, about the EU, the European Union, attempting to make it illegal to link to another website. Okay, think about that for a minute. It's illegal to link to another website in, a, in, in this, per, whoever came up with this idea, in that person's world, that makes sense. Anybody who studied the web knows that that is the antithesis of the web. You don't, the whole point is to share the information freely, right? The link is the heart and soul of the web to say, no, you can't link without permission to that to a given website because that's their intellectual property is the most ludicrous thing I have ever heard. That kind of mentality is what we have to fight. The idea that the web is is not meant to be free 
it's always it's always been an open platform it's always been intended to be anybody who tries to tell you it isn't or tries to monetize it or tries to make profit where profit should not be made by intellectually owning aspects of web technologies that should be in the open and free web well shame on them okay that's who we have to watch out for uh, so I would say we've shifted in our concerns we're away so much from the who are the real evil companies to watch out for to more like what are the nations doing what are we doing with our laws what are we doing with our privacy what are we doing with our uh, technology and our identity again how do we see ourselves as citizens of the world and citizens of the web and what that really means okay can you imagine not being able to link to a resource without having to go first to its copyright owner and get permission that closes the world up again that's old school <laughs> we're going back to the old world no 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 so there you have it that's what I think we really have to watch out for the ignorance the closing of the open and uh, anybody who is over programming the web that's another beef I have which is the JavaScript issue and the uh, absolute uh, turning everything into an application does not acknowledge the fact that we are a resource of humans and documents as well okay, not everything is a web app and not everything should be a web app and that's something that I also think is very important to talk about so identity how we're coming to this that really talks to Edgar's concern as well as the broader overarching uh, identity concerns that I have as we move forward as an industry and as citizens on the World Wide Web we have to begin to think about how do we act within a global environment right culturally uh, socially all of those things and this is to our advantage anybody who has children I imagine uh, you know by giving them exposure to many languages many cultures early on you are empowering them to do better work in the world and to have more choices and options right so I have to look at it that way thank you Molly that was, that was very interesting, interesting. Mm, hi I'm talking about JavaScript uh, how is uh, this web application is 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 evolving uh, I remember JavaScript was and the beginning was something useful then people start uh, start to uh, abuse uh, from JavaScript oh, yeah. with messages and spam and, and stuff like uh, stuff that, that was uh, not very uh, not very uh, helpful for the visitors of the website then uh, flash it was uh, very popular now is that now JavaScript is again very popular we see it every day here in, in, in our in our company uh, it's not only for the for the front end we we see it on the back end right now there are many 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 uh, websites projects and libraries working on the, on the back end how can you see that in uh, in the future how, how can you see the future on JavaScript that that is what, what part of the future is going to take JavaScript in the in the web so I think so what the question is you know what sort of is the is the future of JavaScript uh, in, in the web and I think that I like the way you describe the history you know how first um, you know here we really didn't know I think that we had such a useful language and, and I think that that um, sort of as it emerged, the JavaScript became cooler and cooler, and more more people became aware of how far it could really go as a programming language for the web and in the for the browser, and to really use it for the dynamic aspects of of uh, of of sites, and then of course toward the ever evolving application, the web application. Um, it became you know mission critical there in in the web app but I think early on we you know it, it had been thought of as problematic uh, there were a lot of people there are a lot of people to this day who say who advocate no JavaScript 
right? Test everything with JavaScript off and I don't know anymore. The bottom line is, is that so much of the web is run on JavaScript um, that knowing it, at least being familiar with it for every web developer is very important. And I think that putting it first and foremost as a language ahead of understanding bits and pieces of frameworks is a really good idea from an educator standpoint, okay? Um, I think there's, the, the reason why frameworks emerged in many ways was to, to meet that gap between the non-programmatic thinker and where we've kind of ended up is I think that a lot of programmers, I don't know if people will remember this. You you probably, Victor, you probably remember this, and the people who've been around for at least a decade or so in the industry will remember how it, people used to make fun of HTML. Oh, it's uh, developers, programmers would say, oh, that, you know, who cares about what that looks like? It doesn't really matter if it's uppercase, lowercase, because it didn't matter. They were right. They were not wrong. They were right. Those programmers are absolutely right. It didn't matter. It was sloppy. But it didn't mean that they shouldn't have taken it seriously, because clearly it is very serious, and it became the lengua franca of the web. But forever, I think what's been happening is there's been a desire on the developer part to, uh, and program, programmatic thinkers part to make the web ever more and more familiar to their way of thinking and to their way of operating, which isn't unfair either. It's brought us tremendous benefits, but I think we also need to stop and say, as I, uh, as I kind of implied earlier, wait, not everything is an application. So let's be a little more thoughtful about how we use script, about where we use it, about when we polyfill and mix it and bootstrap and node you know, and do all of these things and use all of these incredible tools that can be extraordinary when used well. But what I see happening is people just pulling in scripts left and right because they're told, oh, if you do that, it will patch for this. And they're just pulling it in because they're patching for a browser. And they're also running all of this extraneous stuff that doesn't need to be processed in the browser. They're not modifying it. And when they're done, when they've moved on and there's no lo longer need for that support, they don't remove it. So it's persisting. So there's these pieces of the web now that are going to persist, right, that, that drag it down. It's just not very clean. So I think that we really need to get a little more introspective about the way we do a web application, about how we apply the programmatics, if you will, uh, the actual programming of the applications um, versus how we approach a site that may have some application functionality like an advanced form. Okay, there's a difference, and I think we need to recognize that difference and use our markup, our CSS, our, our accessibility features with ARIA uh, and, and what have you in the places where we truly are making an application rather than when we're tr just publishing a inter an interactive document or at most a complicated form for interaction. Because everything else can be handled, right? Inline video, boom, it's done. HTML5 browsers, it's done. And you can have fallback if you need it. Uh, but I think, that, I think that what I guess the bottom line, Victor, is what I'm trying to say is I think we've made it more complicated than it needs to really be. We need to back up. Back up and simplify. <laughs> there you go, Victor. So... Uh, Molly, we're approaching the final um, segment of our uh, slot here of our session. And um, before we go any further, I'd like to step in and ask you something that is not necessarily related, necessarily related to the technology side, but on your, uh, well, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, more of on your contribution side, because I see that you have... Uh, an impressive number of achievements and and uh, and also accomplishments. You have you know honors, awards. You have most influential women on the web. 
the most innovative woman in technology in 2010, uh, years of accessibility, the net awards. So if, um, if you could just comment on how this or, or these um, feats have shaped your current mindset in terms of what you're proposing today towards Webolution. Well, um, first of all, I, I think that I'm a better thinker than I am a doer a lot of times. So if I've gotten any awards, I, I think it's for what I think more than what I've done. So I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but um, I don't like the term thought leader. That's a, just a ridiculously uh, absurd term. But, uh, but in terms of shaping or being shaped by thought, I think that here's the thing, Carlos. I came to it very early. So I hit the web before there was a graphic user interface for it. And I think that that's really where all those, excuse me, I'm sorry about that, that was my, uh, my update there. But uh, I think that's really where any accomplishments or awards or anything uh, that I've had, any, any of that has come through. Yeah, there's been hard work, sure. I, I did definitely work very hard. But I think, I think I was really kind of failing toward the end of there of the last few years before I needed to take time away. Um, because I just wasn't doing too well, both in burnout and you know physical uh, physical health. But I think that it came from that longevity and really thinking deeply over those periods of time and seeing how people grew and seeing how other people learned and what we thought and what we felt. Like I'm the one who's going to sit here and go, remember, ten years ago everybody said just use WebKit, right? And now we we're sitting here going oh my god, there's only one browser engine, you know, so okay, remember what you asked for, you just might get it. I'm here <laughs> to remind you that. So I think that's really, if it ties into success, it's longevity, being active, and of course the best part is paying attention to everybody else. I'm interested, I talk a lot, but that doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to what other people are doing, because that's really what interests me, is what are other people doing? that's really cool and what are they complaining about or what are they rejoicing about and I want to know that I, and that's why if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook that's why I'm always poking at people and I'm saying you know I'm always quizzing or trying to have fun and make it fun you know what uh, you know little trivia games and things of that nature because I'm just trying to keep people thinking uh, and and being self-reflexive and that's really it. it it's just tied there's no great feet there's no great feet I'm just loud and I've been around a long time <laughs> and I'm I, I think probably both of us have <laughs> and some of us here in yourself um, Molly one more thing simple question what's next for Molly I am um, uh, that's a really great question. I, I believe that I'm going to continue focusing on pursuits related to the web. Uh, I would like to focus less on deep technology and a, a little more on user experience and not just user experience in the sense of user uh, and, 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 and in terms of engineering the user experience, but the human experience of the web. I want to be involved with projects that are relevant to the social uh, good, that are, that are the web really ev evolving into the web that I believe it can be, which is a, a fundamentally a mass communication system, global and as close to free as anything we have, and as close to open as anything the world has. And therefore, in my way of thinking, it is the best and lends itself most naturally to being the platform upon which if we were to evolve as a global humanitarian species concerned with ev evolving ourselves as a species, then I would say this is the place it's going to start. So I want to be involved with projects related to that and anything related to the human uh, 
the human good and, and to filling needs where there is need. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Molly. And one more because this comes from the audience. I like <clears throat> so we still have about five minutes left. Okay. Okay. Um, this question comes from uh, one of our viewers, Jesus Antonio Castro. Uh, Jesus, thank you so much for your question. He he's wondering. He's asking <clears throat> if we take a if, excuse me. <clears> throat> throat> <Throw strike. clears> throat> if we take as an example a big web platform that is not compliant with web accessibility but wants to take the next step, in your experience, what are some of the most critical key factors that a company usually misses when tackling web accessibility? Okay, so this is, uh, let me repeat the question so I'm answering it properly. So essentially the, the gentleman wants to know if an existing project, very large project, is what it sounds like to me, yes? Uh, if we have to go and strategically, see this would be a te technology strategist job, would be exactly this. And we were at, you were asking earlier, Carlos, and here's me doing exactly that. So okay. the client comes to me and the gentleman says, okay, we have this huge project. How do we tackle? We didn't, we didn't uh, put these technologies in or some of these technologies weren't available to us or we didn't know about, whatever reason. Mm -hmm. How do we begin to address that? First thing that I would say is I would really sit down, and this is actually the first thing for any large site, you have to do an inventory of every single asset that is live and active on that site. And this is a brutally painful bit of work if you have an enormous site, like if you're the BBC <laughs> or something like that, you know, if you just have an enormous websites or, you know, uh, news infrastructure or whatever. Uh, it, it really is har har harmful, but ha you have to begin knowing, this is, the, this is the, the question, do you know what's on your server? And the answer is, hell no, in most cases. I've only met a few very, very obsessive compulsive um, IT guys perhaps and gals that have kept their servers where they know every document and what it does. We don't and that's part of our problem. We're very sloppy. So I say begin with an inventory. What are your assets? What kind of media do you have? Video? Audio? What things do you have to deal with? Right? So are there anything, is there anything in play? Is there, are there transcripts? What do you have? Find out what you have first before you go putting anything in there. And then begin to build from there a real strategy of, okay, uh, in our audience we see this number of people coming in and using it to do X. This is the most important thing we think that they do. Make that path pathway highest priority. So you begin to prioritize uh, based on user. Okay, so that's what I would do. I'd first do an analysis and inventory of what you've got to work with. An analysis and inventory of who you are working with or for. Okay, and then so forth and so on. Expanding from there and gathering all that intel and then really, really re just getting out everybody, all of your good people, your great thinkers and various uh, uh, domain area experts, I would say. So if somebody's got really good user ex user interface experience versus somebody who's got the really, you know, savvy developer experience that can match up with creating uh, an, ex an, an accessible, uh, let's say, transition where they are looking uh, at a stock update and they want to see that stock as it changes, how do we make sure that a non-sighted person is going to know that that dynamic change has occurred. That's the thing they come the most for for the site. Okay, we know we have to address that as a priority. Yeah, that's how you strategize. So you do inventories and begin making priority lists. And that's the best way to approach it. And it's a, it's a no small task. There you have it, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Molly, um, we're about We're to about close, close uh, today's, today's podcast. podcast. Any, final Any final words for our audience here, here for guys? guys? Any uh, recommendations? Any advice? Yeah. Guidelines? Insights? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, 
First, I just want to thank you all so much. Uh, it, it's just been a pleasure to join you. You know, I haven't uh, been out and about too much, and I'm really hoping to ramp that up and start, you know, speaking at conferences again and writing again, and we'll see. But this has been a great honor, and I want to thank everybody for having me and for making me feel so welcome. And, and uh, you know, I just, I have a very... Um, Pues hay, hay algo especial en mi corazón. Pa para ustedes en México, me, me gusta, me encanta mucho, me encanta mucho la gente de México. Pues, and, uh, Victor, so anyway, the last few words I would just say is love what you do. And if you're not loving it, ask yourself, why am I not loving it? And how do I make it? Because this is your life and your children's lives and your spouse and all the people that you love so what you do should be we have a little choice do what you love excellent thank you thank you so much muchas gracias molly Realmente apreciamos victor alguna alguna otra algo something else that you'd like to close the session with victor any any words for molly yeah the name of the next book <laughs> <laughs> For um, closer here. Hey, Molly, look, look at it this way. Look at it this way, Molly. <laughs> look at it this way. You have a whole bunch of guys here who get, uh, who very frequently receive Amazon gift cards. So if you tell them a name, <laughs> tell them a name, and there you go. There's a good way to redeem it. Yeah, I don't have <laughs> anything. I got nothing for sale. <laughs> it's all, all for free. <laughs> bummer, bummer. So you got, but people are welcome to make donations. If they go to my website, they can donate away. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just so happy to be among you again and to be working. And I just want to thank you again both so much, Carlos. Well, absolutely, my pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank we'll be in touch. We're going to be sending you quite soon by uh, FedEx or something a uh, small token of appreciation oh. for you. And uh, it's not digital, so probably you you'll you'll have fun for a change. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Molly, again, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart as well. Gracias. And uh, from on behalf of myself and Nearsoft, uh, it was a pleasure having you here. Victor, thank, thank you so much for, for being here with me too. Muchas gracias, Molly. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.